Uh, if you have your Bibles with you, we're going to go ahead and get started this morning. Our text is going to be out of Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 to 33. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 to 33. And read it from, uh, from here, Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is a Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church, without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated his own body, but he feeds and cares for it, just as Christ does the church, for we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. This is a passage that you often hear at weddings. Um, for husbands, they would be much content if we left it off at verses maybe 22 to 24 and called it a day and went on home. But there's more to the text, and we're, we're going to get to that. Um, so this next couple of weeks, starting today, this week and next week, we're going to talk about the roles of men and women in the context of marriage. So basically the roles of a husband and a wife. I am taking on the roles of a husband. Pastor Sam will take on the roles of a wife. I'm so grateful for that. Thank you, God. <laughs> Uh, so we're going to start off talking about that this morning. Um, I just want to be upfront with you. I'm married now, coming on my seventh year. Uh, as I've read this text, as I've prayed through it, and even before this, as I've been reading through books and things on marriage, I, by no means, am I a guy who can come up to you and say that I've got this nailed down, Pat. I don't, I don't know if I ever will. It may take decades down the road if God gives me that to really come to a place where I can say, anything close to saying I'm like this. And I guess that's the way scripture is, is that as you read it more and more, you kind of understand that you're really short. You really don't measure up to the standards that God has. And it's really convicting. Uh, it's really eye-opening at times, sobering. And the only response that we can have is bring ourselves to the scriptures, repent, and continue on. And that's how I am today as I'm coming to you. I, I, I want to be very clear with you and say that I don't have this down pat. My wife is here. Uh, she's trying to get our baby from off the floor, but she's here, and um, she can tell you that first and foremost. Um, and so when you come here this morning, this is not going to be like Dr. Phil educating you on giving you marriage advice. I'm not Dear Abby. This is none of that. I'm just giving you what I feel like God has said in the Word, and that's it. Take it or leave it. It's up to you. Hope you take it. And may your marriages be blessed. If you're not married, may you, as a husband, future husband-to-be, uh, may you grab something out of this that might help you as you think about marriage going forward. So before I get into the whole idea of what husbands are supposed to do or their responsibilities or God's mandate to husbands, I want to read to you a couple of statistics of marriages of today. All right? um, in 1960, nearly 70% of, of adults in the U.S. were married. In 2008, only 26% of adults were married. Did you get that? In 1960, nearly 70% of adults in the U.S. were married. In 2008, only 26% of adults were married. 40% of adults believe marriage is obsolete. This is interesting. Americans are increasingly marrying people with similar education levels, a similar socio socioeconomic status. Nowadays, doctors tend to cleave to other doctors, executives with other ex executives, in order to form a power couple. So it's no longer the Indian culture, but it's now uh, hidden in the Western culture as well. Eight times as many children are born out of wedlock 
today as compared to 1960. There was a 13% increase in couples living together just from a span of 2009 to 2010. So based on this information, the institution of marriage, this whole concept of marriage is on the decline since 1960, since the past 50 years. Right? And we can spend the next several minutes, I could lead a discussion and get your idea on why do you think marriage has been on a decline? What are the factors that are involved? What's the reason? And you guys would throw back answers at me and you would be partially right. All right? You'd be partially right. But what is the singular reason or the real reason marriage has been on the decline over the last several decades? This past week, a lot of TV shows renewed their season or started up a new season. Any of you guys keep up with shows that just started back up? I guess one person. All right. Well, um, one of the shows that came back on that I, I really love, and I've, you get, I get rarely violent if something else comes on TV uh, from the wife, so uh, it's Person of Interest. I love that show. Uh, for those of you who probably haven't seen it, it's probably, probably not the top one out there, but um, it's a TV show that's based on, the premise is, is that since 9-11 has occurred, um, there has been a need for us to keep a closer eye on people and, and watching what behaviors they perform, what are they doing, are, are there people plotting or planning another terroristic attack against the U.S. And so this need came up and then there was a man uh, by the name of Mr. Finch, who's a character. He's a billionaire inventor. He made up a machine that can literally just, using cameras all over the world, I mean, just really view in on you and what it is that you're doing. And so at any given moment, at any given time, there's a camera watching you, recording what you're doing. He made this invention, he handed it over to the US government for the purpose of finding out people who are plotting terrorist attacks that are creating mass casualties. Well, as the government leaders took on this machine, we begin to find out, as the show continues on, is that they are corrupt and they're evil, they're wicked people. And so anybody who is attached to the machine or, in, or anyone who has knowledge of it, they're finding ways to kill them off. So ultimately, they want to get control of this machine for themselves. So Mr. Finch is one of the people in this, this program that has been seen as someone that's been killed off, but actually he manages to survive and he's living in anonymity. And the ultimate premise of the show is this, is that the, the inventor of this machine has come to the point where he himself had to be killed off by these corrupt, evil leaders of the government. And the reason I bring that up is, is when we think about marriage, and we think about the one who created marriage, which is none other than God himself, the whole premise of why the marriage is on decline now is that we, or our community, our society, has trampled on the inventor of the marriage. And now marriage has been defined in many different ways. Marriage can now be between two people who simply live together for a certain amount of time, and we call that common-law marriage. Marriage can be between two people of the same gender, and we call it a civil union. Marriage can be something that you just do with a sense of, a, with a prenuptial agreement, with an agreement on the, on the side that, you, that basically knows that you can opt out of this marriage at any time and still have these assets that can come to you. So go, there goes the definition of what marriage was invented to be originally. There goes out the window the whole premise of commitment, uh, of faith and believing that your marriage is going to last and divorce is not an option. All of these different concepts and definitions have come about as people have trampled on the inventor of marriage, God himself. They've sought to put him out and they've sought to take this invention marriage and make it how it fits them. For many, marriage is nothing more than an M word where they don't even want to say it. They're afraid of commitment, right? They love the pleasures and the, the joys of being with people and they you know, enjoy the benefits that come with a relationship, but they don't want the commitment. They don't want to be someone who is attached to someone else and, you know, forget that. Don't want that. This is what marriage has become in the West, specifically over the last several decades. Society has trampled and silenced God, the inventor of marriage. And before I can even get further into what 
the responsibilities of a husband are in the context of marriage, we got to look at the decline of the man over the past several decades as well. Uh, back several years ago, even back to the Bible itself, when we think about a, a husband or a leader of a home, we have great images of people who are, are people in control, people in power. And if you remember with me, just an ex as an example, the character Joshua. Joshua, during uncertain times in his life, in his community, he rose up in the midst of the congregation and he said to everybody, choose today whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, we're going to serve God. We're going to serve the Lord. We got these images of, of leaders, men who stood up for what they believed in, for God, for their, their convictions, and they didn't back down. No matter how high the odds were stacked up against them, we have these pillars in their community, in their families, who stood strong for God, for their convictions. But fast forward through the years, through the centuries, even to just as uh, recent as a few decades ago, the men has now become more of an apathetic, lazy, idle couch potato, very wary of any conviction, very wary of any um, sense of purpose or drive. They're more content at just doing what it is that makes them feel good and happy, and that, that is it. Over the last couple of weeks ago, I, s I shared a message on fatherhood and how the men are portrayed as, as lazy individuals. They're, they're even in the media. Uh, you've seen the decline of man, manhood just in the media itself. Over, I would say, 50 years, 60 years ago, men were again portrayed as strong, active leaders. But as recent as the 90s, that's gone downhill. We've got, again, fathers, husbands, who are just content playing games, watching games, sitting on the couch, and that would be it. In just a moment, I want to, uh, just right now, actually, I'm going to show you a small clip uh, of a TV show, Everybody Loves Raymond, to kind of portray what it is that I'm talking about as far as the decline of the man over the past couple of decades. Fran, if you could play that. All right, that's just a little funny clip from TV show Everybody Loves Raymond. As you guys can tell, that's kind of the gist of how men are portrayed today. Just, just saying. I mean, it's comedy, I know. But in reality, if we look at ourselves even, who are we more like? Are we more like uh, someone from the past, like maybe even Joshua, or are we more like Raymond? I don't need to raise your hands, but, you know, if we're honest with ourselves, given the statistics, we're more and more becoming like Raymond, right? Um, so today what I want to do is talk to you just through three different mandates of what God is expecting of you as a husband. Or if you're a man and you're not, you're single, 
when you're going to become a husband, if, if God calls you to, to get married in the future, these are the mandates, some of the mandates I believe God has called us to. And what I'm calling you to isn't going to be easy because like I said, society and the culture around you is portraying men to be completely different than what it is I believe God is telling us in his word. I'm calling you to stand up. I'm calling you to be active. I'm calling you to not be complacent when those are the easiest things that you could easily do right now is just veg out and be complacent. I'm calling you to not do that. I'm calling you to be active, concerned, to be participant, to partake of your family's well-being, especially your role as a husband. So this morning, as we turn back into the text, I'm, I'm not calling you to something easy. And it's very easy just to tune what I say out, and it's not really me, it's what God's Word is saying. It's easy to tune it out. But I want you to, like I told you earlier, take a really long look at yourself in the context of this as being the mirror. If this is the mirror and, and it's really revealing the flaws that you have inside of you, take a long look and figure out what is wrong. And women who are here, if you're married or you're going to be married, whatever, take notes because you can always point back to them and say, look, this is what was said in the message here. You can bring it up in an argument down the road. Oh, no, just kidding. Uh, anyway, Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 to 24. I'm not going to read it again. But the gist of it is, is that wives are called to submit to their husbands, just as the church submits to Christ. Just as Christ is the head of the church, the husband is the head of the wife. Again, I told you earlier, if I left it at that, we could go home and be happy as husbands. But I want you to, to understand, and, and I, I just also want to you understand, this is also the subject of much discussion amongst marriages, I'm sure, all, all around, when they say, you know, when a husband, I can imagine a husband just talking to his wife and say, look, man, the scriptures tell me that you're supposed to submit to me as a woman. So why aren't you submitting to me? You're supposed to submit to me. And then the, woman might be, the wife might say, you know, look, there's no way I'm going to submit to you, you pompous jerk. And, and the, the conversation just continues on and escalates, and it just becomes this massive dissension between the husband and the wife. Husband feels like he's supposed to be the, the, the head and the chief, and the woman says, there's no way I'm going to do that. And that the really creates just a lot of dissension, even within the church. You know, I'm, I'm not going to get into that too much, because I, you know, I'll leave it for Pastor Sam to talk about what submission really means, since that's what the wives are supposed to do, I suppose. But what I want to talk about is the husband's role in that whole process, all right? I want to address that phrase that it says in, in that first couple of verses of Ephesians 5, 22 to 24, that Christ is the head of the church. And it goes on, it says, now as the church submits to Christ. As husbands, we are called to be Christ in our relationships. We are called to be Christ in our relationships with our wives, in our marriages. And so when I think about what that looks like, and I think about Christ, and I think about his interactions on the earth, how did it come about that people surrendered to him? Because submission is essentially an act of surrender. It's what it, when you look at it up, it, it's basically defined as surrendering oneself to another authority. Voluntarily giving oneself up to another authority. And what was it about Jesus Christ that as he walked upon the earth, that people surrendered themselves to him, both before he left earth and even now, people are, are surrendering to him. I mean, sure, you can tell me he's a son of God. He's, he demands that you be submissive to him because he's God's son. But people back then didn't know that he was God's son. Not until much later, even after he left the earth. You could say that he was a guy who had great intellect. He was an amazing teacher. He could round up crowds by teaching just amazing things. Or he had possessed amazing supernatural powers that people would come to, to come and check it out. Is that why people submitted themselves to Jesus? I would argue no. What I would argue is that people submitted to Jesus because of who he was as a person. You look at Jesus and his life, just look at the Gospels, open it up randomly. Open it up to the Gospel of Mark or Matthew, whatever, and you'll find that he is often interacting with random people. Random people. One day he would be touching a leper and healing a leper who has never been touched before, decades before. 
The next night, he might be having dinner with prostitutes and tax collectors. The next day, he might be having children come on his knees and blessing them while the disciples have deemed them as insignificant. Day in, day out, Jesus was among the people. All sorts of people, all types of people, people who were deemed as insignificant, Jesus was found with them. So you want to know why people submitted to him and his authority down the road? It's because he was one among them. It's because he developed that sense of, 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 of reputation that he was worthy of their trust. He was worthy of their trust. And ultimately when he chose to take our nails, take our shame, take our death, ultimately he was worthy of our trust again. Where all of our life and our faith could be placed upon him and we could rest assured knowing that our eternity is secure because of him. He made himself worthy of our trust, worthy of our sur sur submission and surrender. You see, true submission isn't forced. True submission is not forced. That's what we call slavery. You understand? That's what we call slavery. But true submission is, an act of, is a voluntary act where one person surrenders him or herself to another person as authority. That's submission. And the reason why people now and people in the past could surrender and submit their life to Jesus is because he was a trustworthy person. He was a person that people could confide and trust in. And ultimately, he be, we find out that he's a son of God. So our entire life, can be surrendered and submitted to him. And so when I think about the context of marriage and what it means for a husband to, to be trustworthy, because that's the key in getting a, in, in having a wife sur you know, submit to your authority or submit your leadership is, is by them believing and trusting that you as a man are worthy of their trust that you as a man are worthy of their confidence, that as a man that they can trust and believe that you have their best interest at heart. It may not always be easy, it may not always be pain-free, but you as an individual, as a man, they can confide in and trust in because you have cultivated in them a heart that shows that you are worthy of them believing in and, and of trusting them. And again, this goes beyond just making some wedding vows on the day that you got married, but it goes from there on to see to seeing how your life is. How do you handle struggles? How do you handle conflicts? How do you treat your wife? How do you handle temptations? All of these things your wife is paying attention to to determine if you are a man who is worthy of their trust. And if you are, if you're found to be someone who is worthy of their trust, then how much easier is it for a woman to say, yeah, I can trust my husband. I can trust his authority. I can trust his choices, his, his, his call, because I know that he's worthy of my trust. He is worthy of my confidence. See, the question, the, the, I mean, I'm sure the debate is submission and wives submitting to husbands, and that might create a, a great havoc and a great debate, but the reality of it is for us as, as men, as husbands, is how are we living a life that shows our wives that we are worthy of their trust. If we're called to be Christ in our marriages, then we need a love as he did all the way until we're carried away from the earth. I remember the image of Jesus as he's just moments before he's led away to die on the cross. Just moments before as he's about to be taken away, he has the disciples in a room and he strips himself down just to a towel and he goes around and he begins to wash the dirty grungy feet of the disciples he washes he washes and even as he looks up into the eyes of the disciples he knows that there among them are is Judas the one who's going to betray him there's Peter the one who's going to deny him and everyone else pretty much is just about to deny the fact they ever knew Jesus all of the disciples, aside from maybe John, fled. And when I see that, it shows to me this example of how Jesus was a man, uh, was, was the Son of God who literally loved his 
flock or his disciples to the very end, that he became to the point where he was a man, a man who was worthy of their trust and was a servant to all to the very end. It wasn't for a certain time. It wasn't for a certain um, time frame. But even to his death, he demonstrated amazing love. So God's mandate, number one, is learning how to become a trustworthy servant to your wife. Number two, Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 to 27. Again, I'm not going to read it, but we get in this a picture of Christ's sacrificial love, which led to the sanctification and holiness of the church. And before I get to what this means in terms of a, of a husband, let me just explain to you what sanctification means. It's a, it's, a, it's a strange word, it's, it's long and it's weird, maybe something that you don't, haven't heard of in the past. But essentially, when one receives Jesus Christ into their lives, the Holy Spirit comes in and there becomes a, tra- a process of transforming. That person becomes more and more into the image of Jesus Christ. And that process is known as sanctification. And ultimately, we are made holy on the day that Jesus comes back to receive us as his bride or the church as his bride. And what this, these verses are saying is this, is that we as husbands are called to love our, our wives in such a way that they are essentially being sanctified or being made holy. And now when I say that, I'm, I'm, I want to be very careful when I say that husbands do not have the power to make their wife holy, right? We don't have a, a magic wand or an ability to say, wife, be holy, and you're holy. It just doesn't happen, right? But what it is saying is that we as husbands can influence that process. We can basically tell, by by the way we live our lives and the the way we encourage our wives, we can help them along in their process of becoming more and more like Jesus. Our encouragement to them, the words that we say to them, um, encouraging them for things they might do, for choices that they made, would help them in their process of becoming more like Jesus. Or if there are spiritual gifts that your wife possesses and you know it, you've seen it, how edifying would it be to your wife if you would call it out and say, look, I see this in you and I want you to know I really believe that this is what God has gifted you in and I'm encouraging you to utilize that gift some way and somehow. And constantly serving as that encouragement to your wife to edify them, whereas in the past they would not have thought about it. Maybe they didn't even know they possessed such a gift, but you as a husband, as a leader of the home, how amazing it would be for them to hear you say, I I see this in you. I see you possess this amazing trait and ability, and maybe no one else has ever seen it, but I do. And I'm calling calling it out, and I want to encourage you to, to, to use that gift that God has given you. Or how amazing it would be for your wife to hear or to see you, as an example, just being a man of courage, a man of faith, who demonstrates what it is to be a man of prayer, or to be a, you know, just demonstrates what it means to be a man of the faith and the things that you do, backing up what you say with how you act. When they see you in prayer, when they see you doing things, and again, not for the sake of them recognizing what you're doing, but just seeing your lifestyle and being encouraged in their own faith, being a man of conviction, both in, inside the house, outside the house, everywhere, being a man of integrity. How amazing that would be. But I don't know about you. I know from what I'm seeing, men are not the spiritual leaders of their homes now. When God has, even though Pastor Sam has talked about it weeks before, and even the scriptures is alluding to the fact that men are to be spiritual leaders, from what I'm seeing now, the trend is reversed. I'm not saying that it's right, but I'm just saying it like I see it. The trend has reversed. And instead of men who are taking the initiative to to be that spiritual leader for their home, what I am seeing from other families is that it's the women who are now taking initiative to be the spiritual leaders of their home. It's the women who are taking their children out to the prayer meeting, Sunday school, Bible studies, whatever. It's the women who are meeting throughout the week to pray together while their husbands are agitated at home, hungry, waiting for some food. It just seems like that's the trend that I'm noticing nowadays. I'm not saying that any one of you guys are that, because I don't know, and I pray that it's not the case, but I'm just saying from what I'm seeing, this is what the trend is. And it's not right. It was never meant to be that, where the wives are 
re- held responsible for being the spiritual leader of the home. God bless the women that, that have, to have had to have done that, but it wasn't, it's not meant to be that way. Sooner or later, the effect of that is going to drastically affect the family as a whole. It's going to damage the family as a whole. Husbands, your role as a spiritual leader in the home will also depend, well, will really depend on your own personal relationship with God. Let me say that again. Husbands, your role as a spiritual, spiritual leader of the home will depend on your relationship with God. That is to say, if your relationship with God is weak, inconsistent, or non-existent, that will reflect in your family's well-being. That will affect your family as a whole. Again, if, you're, if your relationship with God is weak, inconsistent, or non-existent, that will directly impact your role as a spiritual leader of your home. That is to say, if you're also hypocritical, if you're saying one thing, but your lifestyle at home is totally the opposite, your children, your, fi- your wife will pick up on that. And you, whatever you say means nothing to them from then on out. You know, I've spoken about how husbands can encourage the wife and the effect that that can have. But as I mentioned a few weeks ago, I want to talk about how this can affect the children. And I think that's what's more sobering, is that we have young kids who are growing up in a home, and you as a father who, who is supposed to be the spiritual leader of the home, if you, your life isn't backing up what you're saying, then your child, your children, are negatively impacted. All right? Um, this is a sobering truth when we think about it. And I want to share you just a couple of examples of something I came across. So I work in the correctional system. Uh, so a few weeks ago, I met with a young man who was 23 years old. Um, he really looked a lot younger than he presented. He seemed as if he was probably 15 or 16, 17, something that age, a teenager. 23 years old. As a teenager, he got hooked on pornography. Someone brought it, he got hooked on it. As he got older, he began to try to engage and trying to have sex with, with girls. And now he sits in jail. He's, as he became addicted to sex, he sits in jail now with not one, but two accounts, two accounts of sexual assault on a minor. Two counts of a sexual assault on a minor. He sits in jail as a 23-year-old. Uh, the other day, I come across someone else in the Christian or the church circle who is a young man, probably 21 years of age. He also, within a a moment just got addicted to pornography and sex and then came to find out that he opened up and said that you know he had about he had sex with two uh, with women sorry with one woman 200 times Um, and he's 21 not married but he opened up about the fact that he's got this addiction and the reason I bring this up to you guys is that I mean you guys have all been around for a while we know what the world is like we understand the dangers that this world can present and how one choice of sin or maybe one to two or three choices of sin can become a pattern. And that pattern can become so destructive that it can destroy your life. It can destroy the way you view life. And I don't know about these guys as parents. I believe that the guy in jail didn't really have a father figure in his life at all. He didn't have a father figure in his life. And so when you think about parenting kids in this culture, in this society nowadays, I really hope you take into account that your decision to be apathetic or to be complacent or to be ignorant of God in your home, it doesn't just affect you. I hope you understand that it affects the well-being of your child as well. I'm not saying that just because you lead your home well and you're you're a great spiritual leader that your child is going to turn out to be 100% great. I'm not saying that, but I am saying that that would help, that that could help them see what it would you know, who Christ is, it, it would help them understand just the message of the gospel just in your life, in your lifestyle. Think about your wives, think about your children. Ultimately, they're both affected by how we leave them spiritually. Uh, God's mandate number three. Know that your marriage represents the gospel of Jesus Christ. Know that your marriage represents the gospel of of Jesus Christ. Throughout this text that we just read, there are constant images that are alluding to the gospel. We've got uh, the representation of Christ's love for the church as being symbolic and representing how our love for 
our spouses are supposed to be with each other. Uh, we've got the image of sacrificial love, how Christ gave himself up for the church in the same way the husband is to give himself up for the wife. Uh, we have this beautiful picture of, of union, this, this image of how the church and, the, and Jesus are, are now one and how in marriage we are to become one flesh. All of these images are beautiful in that they portray for us the magnitude and the beauty of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I would say that on earth, there is no greater platform to convey the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ other than marriage. There is no greater platform on the earth other than marriage to convey the gospel of Christ. It's much more than a symbolic representation of the gospel. I want to say that marriages are held together by the sheer essence of what the gospel represents. Marriages are held together by grace, mercy, compassion, love, sacrifice, perseverance, all of these things that you would, con you, you would say it makes up the gospel. And those of you who are not married, you think of marriage as some amazing bliss, and maybe some of your friends are trying to bring you down to reality, because it's not always blissful, always 100% every single day. For those of us who have been married, we know that Sure, the wedding day was great, awesome, but somewhere down the road, it starts to get less awesome. And that's when we begin to realize that there's sin in us. There's sin in our spouse. And as we are married, it's in that context that that sin starts to come out. Whatever that is, you know, it just comes out. And it's in the context of the gospel, it's in the context of marriage that we have a, an opportunity to re resolve it in a way that is Christ-centered. It's in the context of marriage that we have an opportunity to not beat each other up over our mistakes or our flaws, or that we've probably done that, but it's in the context of marriage that we have a chance to show humility, extend grace, extend forgiveness, and feel and experience healing. And it's in the context of marriage that we see ourselves becoming more and more like Christ Jesus. I want to encourage you to pick up a book if you haven't read it already. It's called A Sacred Marriage by Gary Thomas. It's a very, very good book that shows us how marriage can be, make us holy ourselves, how God uses marriage to make us holy. Again, it's called A Sacred Marriage. It's by Gary Thomas, an amazing book. Um, so as we talk about this becoming a platform for the gospel, people around us who see our lives see who Jesus is, in, Jesus is to us in our marriages. When they see us respond to tragedies the way that we do, or, or, or seemingly hopeless times, when they see us respond to it with hope as a couple, when, we see, uh, when they see us celebrate joys in the way that we do, when, when they see us struggle, people around us start to take notice at the fact that we're not like other couples who might give up or divorce or separate or for whatever reason, we are still going to hold on to each other because we believe God has got us and God has got us together. And sooner or later, I believe people will take notice. People will take notice. And their whole concept of love, their whole understanding of what love means can change. As I told you before, the statistics show it, marriage is on the decline. That means love is on the decline. People's understanding of love is on the decline. But when they can see the love of Christ in your marriage, then they are blessed to be able to experience what it means to be, um, to, to possess the amazing news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, as I close this morning, I want to just bring to your attention just a small story of a, of a pastor who was a pastor of mine for the past several years ago. Um, he was a man who loved to serve the Lord, and he was in the, he was constantly doing ministry all the time. And his wife, it was just the two of them, it was his wife who was in the background working to support him, making sure that he was taken care of, making sure his needs were met. His wife was often in the shadows. And we really didn't get to hear too much about her because that was where she was. She was in the background. Well, about seven or eight years ago, she was diagnosed with a form of cancer uh, in her mouth, I believe it was, and Essentially, a tumor was growing um, inside of her, her head. And ultimately, she became very sick, and the prognosis was really bad. And 
through that, we got to see our pastor shift his role from becoming this guy who preached and took care of a church, but he then became the guy who went to his wife's side to take care of her day in and day out. And the same woman who was once being the one who cared for her husband now received care and attention from the husband that she poured into. And I say all this to convey to you the fact that my understanding of love and ministry really changed there as well. I was impacted by what I saw, by seeing a man who I often saw on stage preaching the gospel, doing great things for the Lord on the stage, now in a room holding his wife's hand, consoling her, helping, making sure she was taken care of up until the fact that she, she died. And I say that to you all to understand, to help you understand that marriages can convey a message to the people who observe it from the outside. It could be a youngster, it could be your neighbor, it could be your coworker, it could be anybody, you don't know who, but anybody at any given time, at any given moment, can be impacted by your marriage. Simple conversation, simple word. The fact that you're still together conveys a lot to people around you. So understand that your marriage represents the gospel of Jesus Christ. So guys, I, I shared with you a few mandates of what it's like to be husbands who are godly and what is required of you in your marriage. I hope you understand that the mandate, number one, is to become a, a man who, is, who essentially is a trustworthy servant, who can elicit the trust of your, your wife and your children. Uh, that you understand, number two, that you are to be a man who leads um, your, fam your family, especially your wife, into becoming a woman who is both sanctified and holy before God. And that lastly, you understand that your marriage is a great and perfect platform for the gospel. In just a moment, we're going to take communion. And I just want you to take a moment to understand the magnitude of what the bread and the, the juice represent in the context of marriage. And just take a moment to reflect on your Savior how through his love and through his life on this planet that he conveyed what it means for us to be people who can trust him. And this morning, I don't know what struggles or what sin you might have in your life, but I want you to know that Jesus wants to make it very clear to you that he is worthy of your trust. He is worthy of your hope. He is worthy of giving your entire life over to him and say, God, I surrender. I submit myself to you. All I am, all I am, I give it over to you. Scriptures show us that he is worthy of that trust. He won't let you down. He is worthy at any moment of any day for you to believe upon him and call upon him and understand that he is your God and your Savior. And if there's any doubt, I just want to remind you of what that represents, the, the, the bread and the juice, that his body was broken for us, for you and for me. And in his body being broken, we have this assurance of knowing that our sin, the things that we did that were wrong, both in the past and the present, are hung up on that cross with him. He, he endured it. He bore it upon himself. That death he endured that price he paid, that suffering he felt, that was meant for us, but he took it himself. And the beautiful story is, is that death could not hold him down. We sang it just a moment ago, death could not hold him down. And so even with all that sin and the, and the, and the grime and the mess ups that he endured for us, that did not hold your savior down, but he rose again. And now he's seated on the right hand of the Father waiting for you to, to see you face to face. Until then, he's left you his Holy Spirit to lead you, to guide you, to sanctify you, to make you into becoming more and more like him on this planet so that ultimately your life will demonstrate to people around you who Jesus is, your marriages, your choices, everything about you would convey to the people around you who Christ Jesus is, that they could find hope, that they could find healing, they could find satisfaction in him. In essence, that's the gospel. So as we are about to take communion in just a moment, reflect on the cross, reflect on his death, 
and his resurrection for you. Let me pray for us. Jesus, each time we take a moment to look upon the cross, if we really take the moment to seriously look upon your cross, it can't help but bring tears to our eyes because we remember, we're reminded of how our how deeply we are loved by you. When we feel so unlovable, when we feel so unworthy, when we feel so dirty, we are broken people, yet we look at the cross and we can't help but feel a blanket of your love covering us, embracing us and sharing and just telling us that, you're, that we're your child, we're your children, that you love us. We're so grateful to you, Father. Grateful to you for, for Jesus. And I just pray for us this morning as we're taking a moment to reflect upon you and the cross that we would just experience your presence in a very tangible way today, that you would make your words of love known to us again this morning. If there be sin in us, that you would cleanse us and wash us and make us right before you. And dear God, I pray that we would be people who would ultimately live our lives from here on out for your gospel, for your glory, that our lives, our our out there would be on display for the sake of the gospel, that our marriages would be a perfect platform for the gospel to, to reach those around us. We just want to thank you so much that you, that you made that decision to love us and that you are worthy of our trust. We thank you, Savior. We thank you so much. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.